Okay, good morning. Guten uh, Tag, Thank you very much. They call you Mora Tachtel. Um, when the Rebbe assumed leadership officially, Yud Shvat Tavshin Yud Aleph, So the Rebbe said after the Mimer that when you assume a new position, you make a statement that's the custom of the land. Essentially, you lay out the mission for which you were uh, sent to this world. And the Rebbe did exactly that. He made a statement. Of course, in the very Mimer, Basilagani, the statement that this is the Deir Shvi, and the mission is very clear, like Shvi, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Chanti B'Seicham, to finish the job and bring the Gulu Lamata Masar Tvah. Unambiguous, to the point, without any arichis. So I think we can learn from that. I mean, Lahavdil, the whole world is based on any organization or company or corporation they have to always begin with a mission statement. Without the mission statement, you really don't have any direction or guidance. That's why the Ebershter did indeed tell Meshur Rabbeinu Ba'asil Migdash B'Shachanti B'Seicham, the shortest mission statement ever written. Two words. B'Shachanti B'Seicham. So we have to all ask ourselves, especially you have the unique privilege to be not just teachers and mashpies, but actually shapers of lives. That's what you are. You have Tanli uh, Anefesh, you have Refoshes, that you are dealing with on a daily basis. In many ways, you can make a difference to the entire destiny of every one of your students. We'll talk only to the positive, but it's also, we live in a world with many challenges. So you have to always ask yourself, you don't want to get caught up. And they say, you want to see the forest from the trees. Because you can get caught up in details, even Kedusha you can details, and forget what is the whole Matara in the first place. The Rebbe Rashab says that before he established Tehidu Mitzmimim, that there's a Givalgit Senyar, I don't remember the exact amount, but a long time. So, Gibal the Senor of the Eilim. Because he was struggling with a big question. How did Rebbe didn't set up a yeshiva in Chabad? The Mitla Rebbe didn't, the Tzemach Sedek didn't, his father Rebbe Marash didn't. How does he have the chutzpah to suddenly establish a yeshiva when four generations of Chabad Rabbeim didn't? So he had to find a very strong justification for it. And he said, that's a Gibalgit, he was struggling. And then he finally did establish Tem Chet Mim and Tafresh Nun Zayin in 1897. And he actually wrote a whole Kuntus just to explain why. For Kuntus Eitz HaChaim. We explained why did he establish this yeshiva. There's enough yeshivas out there. They teach Teda, Yerush Shemayim. He wasn't saying the yeshivas were not adequate. And the contrary, he said they're fully adequate. As a matter of fact, all Chabad Bochim, where do they think they learned? In those yeshivas, up to that point. So the Rebbe Rashab felt the need, we definitely have to reaffirm and revisit why do we have a school in the first place? It's not just to give jobs, it's not just because of Chinook period, because there are very many good schools. In many ways, you can ask the question, what's the unique mission of Pesifka? In contrast, to all other mitzvahs of Chinook al and here we're not here to knock anyone. We're on the contrary, we're here like the Rebbe Rashab, he didn't say they were lacking. He just said we need something that they don't have. So I think maybe each of you should probably give it some thought. You don't have to answer to me, obviously. I'll uh, share my thoughts through my few words here. At the end, I'll spell out what I think the mission is in short. But meanwhile, you can give it some thought. And I'm sure if everyone wrote down on a piece of paper, you probably wouldn't all have the same mission. Which is also interesting. 
So, a number of years ago, I was uh, speaking in a shul, Shabbos, in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I was speaking about, uh, with the audience, a very mixed audience, secular, religious, all types. Not that we like any labels, but just uh, somewhat identify. And I spoke about this concept that uh, in life, just like any business needs a mission statement, so too do we need one in life. And I asked the people, I said, do you know what your personal mission statement in life is? Anyway, after my talk, a guy came over to me. He's no longer here in this world. And he said to me, I heard very closely what you said, and I want to tell you a story that happened with me and the Lubavitch Rebbe many, many years ago in the late 60s. And you can share the story. If you want to use my name, fine, don't. It's up to you. So let me share with you what he shared with me. He said that he learned the 770 and he was a good student. He had learned the uh, became a Rav. A Dayan, so he had both Yeda, Yeda, Yodin, Yodin as it's called. But he was a, an academic and he was looking to learn more. So he wanted to go to college. He said, not for any wrong reasons, just to study. He liked knowledge. So he was in Yechidus by the Rebbe. So now approximately 1968 or 69. And he wrote to the Rebbe in his note that he wants to go to college, he wants a bracha from the Rebbe. And the Rebbe asked him, do you want a bracha or an etzer? So he says, well, I asked for a bracha. So the Rebbe said, a bracha with the etzer is all more best. A bracha with the etzer is always better. And the Rebbe said, in my opinion, you shouldn't go. Now he had a little chutzpah, he told me, and he said to the Rebbe, he asked the Rebbe why. Especially considering that the Rebbe himself went. So the Rebbe said, that's why I'm telling you, because I went, I have experience, I can't talk to you if I didn't have experience with any credibility. So he asked the Rebbe to explain, and the Rebbe said to him, what are the subjects you're interested in? So he said, so he shared the subjects he likes, mathematics, physics, psychology, a few other things that Jews like. And um, the Rebbe took out of his drawer a piece of paper, yeah, you don't hear these stories every day. Put it on the, with, a, with a pencil, and he called call him over and said, I'd like to, you to draw for me a circle. So he drew a circle, and the Rebbe said, is this a perfect circle? So he said, no, you can't draw a perfect circle. So what would you need to create a perfect circle? He says, I need a compass. So the Rebbe had a compass in his drawer. And he took out a compass and stuck the needle in the paper, and with a pencil created the circumference of a perfect circle. What changed, the Rebbe said? He said, well now I had a, a hub, a center, a center point which created focus, a focal point that I can create a perfect circle around, but equally distant from the center. So the Rebbe said to him these words, he said, all the knowledge you'll ever acquire in life, no matter what knowledge that is, is all the circles we create. But it is the mission of your life, why you're here, that you will not necessarily learn in these books. And the mission is the center. And if you don't have the center, you can have all the knowledge, and you'll have many circles, but they'll be incomplete, jagged, different ones. They won't have that the centrality, that focus, that perfection. And then the Rebbe told him something even sharper and said, there are so few of us in this world that can help others learn their mission in life. So for you to go and put all your energy and study all these topics, as important as they may be, there's so many others that are studying them and mastering them. So if you only had a thousand lawyers and a thousand accountants and only one doctor in the city, would you become an accountant or a lawyer? You become a doctor, because you need the doctors. The Rebbe said, we need soul doctors today. We have doctors, we have lawyers and accountants. 
We need people who know what a mission is and teach others. So every one of us that does that is represents thousands and thousands of people that don't have that. Anyway, he continued with uh, somewhat, I would say, sadness. He even cried a bit. He said, you know, I did not listen. I went off and did my thing. Yes, I got a PhD in this topic, in that subject, and so on. I drew many circles in my life, but never a complete one. Until this day, I still don't have a complete circle. Exactly as the Rebbe had suggested. He said, you could use that story. You talk about this. If you need to use the story. And I have used it many times. As a matter of fact, every year, when they have the campus, Kambalan campus comes to this neighborhood, so they always bring the books of a lot of students to my house. And I always tell the story, and they always, everyone, and we're talking about secular students, are completely uh, mesmerized by this story. They right away want to know, so how do I find my mission? I shared this story a few years ago here in Beis Rivka for the 12th year, for the 12th grade graduates. I was asked to come and speak a week before their graduation, why they shouldn't go to college. So I remember those that invited me, maybe some of you in the room here, said to me, you know, you have to, some of them are going to college and this and that. So I said, so you come a week before they graduate, they already made their decisions, you should have called me four years ago, or me or somebody. And more bluntly, I said, what did you teach them for 12 years? I mean, what am I going to tell them in one talk that you didn't teach them? And I told them this story, and a girl got up, got up and she said, well, what's wrong with being an interior designer and also fulfilling your mission? And I saw this was what was on their mind. That's why I felt appropriate to begin by identifying a few key points that I think is what a Chassidish school that the Rabbeim established, which is all an extension of the Rebbe Rashab Tenchet Mimim. What is it? unique? And what should we be teaching our students? And I'd be very honest with a perfect disclaimer. I'm not a teacher in this school. I did teach here many years ago. So actually I'm humbled to stand before you because you're all qualified and I'm not here to tell you how to teach or what to teach. I'm here really just to add perhaps some of the things that maybe not always spelled out that come straight from the Rebbe's words. So the first thing and the most important thing I think is that you're here to teach everyone and yourself why we're here in this world. All the chinuch al taras and all the mezdas, and say the best possible ones that teach a great education, and Yerushalayim, Teirah Mitzvahs. But what is the mission of why a human being, why a Jew, why you, why each one of us, every one of your students is here in this world in the year 2022, Tav Shem Pei Beis, going on to Tav Shem Pei Gim. That's why we have a Rebbe. The Rebbe was sent to this world on a mission to tell us what our mission is. Simple, simple as that. If the Rebbe didn't tell us that, then what is the purpose of a Rebbe? And the Rebbe told us what the mission is. The mission is, in my own simple English, to be not just reactive but proactive Jews that will bring godliness and the light of Tehra Mitzvah to every person you meet proactively with the goal of bringing Mashiach. Everything else is a detail. All the knowledge you learn, even Tehra knowledge, even those Tehra Shashal Kodesh Baruch Hu and learning Tehra's and Inyan La'atzmi, no question. You learn Tehra, you're connecting to Hashem. But there's something more. You learn Tehra all the generations. What's unique now? is to be exactly that. So it's a mission-oriented Judaism. And to teach every person that you have unique skills, that you and only you have, everywhere. The Davis would never create two people the same. What does he need? Two of the same. The Rebbe repeated many times in Fabrengans. And everything else is secondary. Why did your Neshama come to this world? Why are you blessed with a particular personality? whether it's a people person, whether it's a, a cerebral person, whether it's an emotional person, whether it's someone that's good with their hands, someone that's musical, 
I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of different Ain Day Asay Shabbos skills, talents that we all have. And it was all given to you as resources to fulfill your mission and make Nadir B'Tachtein. And this is the underlying, the undercurrent of everything you learn. To be honest, when I was in Yeshiva and I went to Tem Mimin, we learned a lot of Tehid. But I don't know how often this was ever even said. We had to figure it out on our own. Either hearing a Fabregen, or you get a little older, you start realizing. Because you could get caught up. I mean, I knew more about the Diyukim between Rashi and Tasmus and the 45 different opinions of how you learn the Rashi than why we're here in this world. I'm not saying that, I know it sounds a little uh, sarcastic, but that's an example. And I'm not speaking here just theoretically. You can speak to shluchim and shluchis, let alone others that are not necessarily in that position. They will tell you, I learned a lot of Teda, but not necessarily to know what my mission is. I'm talking about even in our own ways. So this doesn't mean you have to say it in every class you give, but it means it's always there. And we never forget it because details can distract. That's a fact. The second thing is Aceite versus Surmara. I was shown by Gordon in the early years, or the early Shluchim, once asked the Fidi Kadeba whether he was in Lakewood or whether he was in New Jersey, I'm not sure where he was at the time. But he said, what do you do when you meet Jews who are uh, not exactly fully shamed to their mitzvahs? You tell the Musa, what do you do? Do you ignore it? So the Fidik Rebbe said to him, a famous story, you may know it. He said, you, Hashgach Prat, is you, your father, when you left Russia, you went through Turkey. In Turkey, there's a thing called a Turkish bath, called a spitz, sauna. And uh, everything is Hashgach Pratis. So you know, the custom in one of these bathhouses is you come in, you go into these very hot rooms, and um, it opens up your pores, and the sweat and the dirt and the grime comes out. Then you go higher on the second floor, the second level of the Schwitz, heat rises. So now the stronger heat opens up even more fine pores, and even more grime comes out. And then, the custom is, you come out of the schwitz, you pay an attendant to smack you with these eucalyptic leaves. They have these brooms that get your circulation going, and for some reason that uh, refreshes you. And it doesn't, it's not pleasant, it actually hurts. So the Rebbe Phoenix Rebbe said to him, your job is, first you have to warm up a Jew. Then you have to elevate him the next level and warm him up even more. And then he'll ask you to shmeisen him. He'll ask you to give him Muslim. Up to that point, no, you don't say anything negative. Now you could say the Fidik Rebbe was talking about Teneke Shanishbu, secular people. Yeah, we can submit that that's not necessarily the case. The Rebbe made it very clear. I don't know if you ever did a survey. I didn't. But I've spoken to enough people who um, come away from Chinuch that they grew up in, thinking that Judaism is all about not being bad. And the punishments that are either there to deter you or to suffer the consequences. And I'm not just talking about people who are Tanakh Shanish who don't know better. There is, for some reason, I don't know why it comes from, there is this sense of um, association with things that are religious and Yiddishkeit, that God is punitive and angry, and our Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is coming and we tremble, because who knows what the Hashem is going to do for us, to us. And therefore we need to make a deal with it. Some would call that superstition, some call it Amunah, whatever you want to call it. But that is an attitude many people have. It's like a childish attitude, but it's there. Where Hashem is like this principle, the so one white bear in heaven ready to strike us with lightning when we misbehave. Well, there is such a perception. 
I'm not going to say that we are the, at fault, but we definitely have it. I see that rings every time I say something a little, uh, I don't know. Look, I wasn't censored. I was said I could say anything I want, right? I just want to make it clear. My speech was not written, nor was it read by anybody. I didn't even read it, to be honest. We definitely have a responsibility, especially coming from a chassidish background where we're taught. People make a mistake that they think the difference between chassidish and musa is that we don't have a concept called musa. Or hechir techir samisech. The trainers has that. The difference is what is the emphasis? Is it about v'shavto ha'eda v'hitzilu ha'eda, as the Rebbe says. Rosh Hashanah tov shinun beiz. V'eisata, the last Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe was here and spoke to us and gave us a bracha. Look at that bracha, since it's coming Rosh Hashanah now. The whole bracha is about that yema din is Rosh Hashanah, but the whole purpose of din is v'shavto ha'eda v'hitzilu ha'eda. It's not din as an end in itself. It's all about love. V'hafta recha kamecha to call God l'beteda. That's the only cloud one. Everything else is derivative. Now, I know we say this and we teach it. The question is, and I don't know if anyone's ready to subject themselves, your students are sitting in the class and they feel that. Now listen, we're all human beings, both as parents and as teachers. And sometimes, whether we know it or not, we project our own insecurities and our own guilt and our own, uh, I guess, fear of God onto those around us. So our children, our students, maybe pick up our own stuff. But that's what's called working on yourself. That's called the idea of understanding that Chassidus emphasizes the Ava, above all. This doesn't mean ignoring discipline, it just means what the focus is. How often does this bell ring? My days, a class was like 30 minutes. That was recess. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, so that's point number two. Point number three is teaching methodology, not just facts. Teaching students not what to think, but how to think. If you hear any fabrenga from the Rebbe, what you hear is not just a question and an answer, but like Siddin would say, when you look at the Maim of Siddin, it asks a question, and then the Maim doesn't say, Yesh Lehmet, it says, Acha Inyan Hu. Daltareb and Tanya. Acha Inyan Hu. Because you're never just coming to answer a question. You're coming to explain the whole Inyan from its root. When you understand it properly from the root, you automatically answer all the questions. Methodology. I'll just give you one example. I mean, it's a little radical example, but it's a good example. It just comes to mind. It was Tavshim Em Gimel and um, Shabbos Pasha B'Shalach. And the Rebbe, I think the second Sikha, like almost like a Maimon Amuzgar, parenthetically, the Rebbe says, Mashiach is going to come very shortly, and moving to Poshet, we already went through all the Xedas, and Mecham is Gei and all the Ashmodis, and Lo Yiyeh Eid, there'll never be again. Now everything is going to be peaceful. And Chaz Roshan to say that anyone will have to die. Or anyone will be killed. It's more or less what the Rebbe said. Being someone at the time that I had discussed to be a chez and a maniach, remembering and writing the Fabregans. And we had the opportunity to ask questions. And as I can tell you, I exploited the opportunity to the best of my ability. You know, you have access to the Rebbe. Why not just ask everything? So wherever I could stick in a question, I did. And we got answers because it wasn't just private questions, it was for the Kavyochel, for the public. So I asked Sunday morning, I remember I wrote a note into the Rebbe, and said there's a Gemara Sanhedrin that says, on the Pasuk Kharke B'nei Sheis, Bolok, it says there that uh, two opinions, that before Mashiach comes, either two thirds of the world Will, th- will be killed, or two-thirds of two-thirds, depending how you tie shes, shes. That's a gemot. It is a gadita. It's not a halacha. But it still says so. So I asked the Rebbe, later fast, the way we wrote it respectfully, what was the kavan of the Rebbe when he said that nothing like that will happen? 
And the Rebbe could have written the Gemara's an opinion and stopped uh, after the Maskon. Anyway, the Rebbe wrote an answer like this. Bli neder, yiduba bezeb, yisfadus kedish habo'alein l'tev. Whenever the Rebbe wrote that, it meant that he had a lot to say on this. Because the Rebbe could answer, he answered very often, well, 99% the Rebbe would answer in writing. But here he said, I'll speak about it next Fabring. Next Shabbos was not a Fabring, Yisrael was not a Fabring, and the next Fabring was Mishpatim and Gimel. And the Rebbe spoke about the second Sikh, I think the Rebbe began and said that the Gifrekt, about the Gemara, how that stems with what the Rebbe said. And I was already waiting two weeks quite eager to hear what the Rebbe is going to say. And the Rebbe says, I remember when I heard this, I right away, oh wow. The Rebbe says, But the Ikesh Kashi is. And as usual, the one who asked the question then to confuse what the real question here is. The Rebbe said, The Kashi is Nishtaf Mir. The Kashi is on the Gemara. The Rebbe said, The question is not on me, the question is on the Gemara. It says clearly, Racham al Kol Maisov. The Ebishta has compassion on all his creations. And we know when the, even when the Mitzrayim were drowning, the Ebishta said, You're saying Shira to the Malachim. My Siyodei Tevin Biyam. My handiwork is drowning in the ocean, and you're saying Shira. So God's creation, she is Racham al Kol Maisov. How could the Ebishta go ahead and kill two thirds of his own people, of his own creation? I remember, even though it was. The cardinal sin not to con- for, not to, uh, to get distracted. I was thinking to myself, oh, how did everyone learn this Gemara until now? And the Gemara says it quite the fetish. But by the Rebbe, it was such a given that it's not possible that he couldn't learn the Gemara Pshat. That is called methodology. Because it's not how to understand the Gemara. How could they wish to kill his own people, his own creation? Anyway, just to tell you what the answer was, not to leave anyone hanging. It's already a sikhah printed in Chelik Chav Gimel in Bolok. If you look there at the end of the sikhah, it says the sources, you'll see it from Bishalach Mishpatim Nam Gimel, which has nothing to do with Bolok. Because it wasn't a sikhah in Bolok, it was a sikhah just as a mitten year. But it was connected to that person. So then the Rebbe went into a whole discussion. First he said maybe Pshat is that they won't be killed, they'll die out because they won't have children. They just will take away their capacity to have children. And then Rebbe Sheol said, absolutely not, that's also achzonis, that's also cruel. And the Rebbe's answer ultimately was that the Lashon Charket, like Lashon Keloyan, doesn't say Misa, doesn't say death. The word is Bitok, that there'll be a Shini Hatsuda, their whole entity will change, so compared to who they were before, like we talk about when you cash or something, when, you read, when it comes white hot, it changes the Mitzias of something. So their Mitzias will change. And compared to their own disease, it's as if they would have died out. But not that physically they would. The point I want to make is, it, for me, it was a whole change, a paradigm shift in thinking. Because the Rebbe, instead of answering the questions people ask, how do we find that the Torah talk about racism and discrimination? We could kill out a whole nation called Amalek, men, women, and children. Or Laishchaya called Nisham, all the people in Eretz Yisrael. The Taters, and everyone looks for all kinds of answers. The Rebbe's approach always is the other way around. It's a Taters Chesed, and a Taters Emes, and the Ebers is Teva Etzim Atev, and Teva Atev Lehetiv. Once you know that axiom, then the question is the other way around. How is it possible, Taki? Instead of looking for a Taters. This is called a different way of methodology. Obviously, I'm not going into answering all these questions here. But methodology is called empowerment. You empower a student. What did the Rebbe say so often about a Talmud to be like Shel Heves Eilem Some of you have probably been teaching quite a few years. What's the biggest nachas? When you get a phone call 20, 30 years later, or 10 years later, and you hear how a student has been empowered, that wherever they are in this world, even though you're no longer with them physically, but they learn something from you that changed how they think, that changed how to think, not just what to think. That they could solve a problem even though you may not have given them the exact answer. That's called empowerment. Today there are thousands of us that were empowered by the Rebbe. Even though the Rebbe may not have answered technically every question on earth. But he answered enough that we can derive from the Rebbe's methodology. How do you answer a question? How do you solve a problem? What do you do when two people come to you and they have an argument? 
And you know as a given you can't take sides. How do you approach a problem? This is far, far more and deeper than just learning Pshat in Aposuk or in Nach or in uh, Halacha or in history or anything like that. Because you're teaching methodology. Now obviously this is connected to the other points I made before when you have a mission-driven education that automatically means that everything in Teda is tools for us how to fulfill our mission. So that goes back to the method. The method. And the final thing I want to say is, for lack of a better word, maybe the word uh, dignity. Um, I heard the story from, let's see here, from your father, Rabbi Hirshul Chitra of Ashal. He said around Tosh Chavov, 1966, I think he lived on Cross Street. So he had a shear once a week in his house, Rabbi Mentlik, Rabbi Mordechai Mentlik, all of us all in Rosh Hashiva, in 770 for many years, he used to teach a shear in Gemara, half hour, something like that. Afterwards, he would tell stories from the good old days. So this is what transpired. It's a two-part story. One part Rabbi Chitrik told, and one part Rabbi Mentlik told. And then, then they discovered they were both the same story. So it was in 1949, Tavshin Tess, Erev Kippur. That's the part Rabbi Mentlik told. I should start with the other half, I think it's easier. Rabbi Chitrik was a bocha then in 770, 1949. And there was another bocha, there were a few bocha there, in those years, there were quite a few that were not even from Chabad Mishpachas. It was the yeshiva that people went to. There was one bacher who came from uh, a family from the Midwest. And finally, he was of age. Someone had a shidduch, a good shidduch with a hush of a family from Bar Park. The grandfather's name was Rav Pardis. So he was a hush of it, not a Chabad per se, but close to, very friendly to Chabad. The day of the, what they call then a vort, what we have today, a lachayim, tenoyim, a vort, was in Borough Park. And this uh, chosen was there. Obviously his parents, for the first time they flew in from the Midwest. They were meeting the family for the first time. It was already the engagement party. And Apartus gave one look at the father of the chosen and didn't like what he saw. He saw this like farmer type, a poyer, what he would call. And even had, I think, some dirt under his nails. That's, I think, the way he said the story. You know, he was like, uh, was not, didn't be fitting. So Apadis called in his children, who were the parents of the Kala, and said, no, no, this shidduch is not for us. In those days, they listened to grandfathers, I assume. And, um, and they broke up the shidduch right there and then. The whole thing was canceled. This Bachel came back to 770 crying, brokenhearted. And he meets Rabbi Chitrik. Who knew? They, were, they learned together. What happened? He told him what happened. What do you do? So Rabbi Mentuk says, and here's the other part of the story. In that Erev Yom Kippur, Tovshin Tess, Tovshin Yud, I should say, Tovshin Yud. So it would be the last Erev Yom Kippur, the Fidik of the Pastor, the Stalkers was Yud Shvat. Rabbi Mentlik was downstairs, then downstairs was what we call upstairs now, where the Rebbe's room is. That's where Rabbi Mentlik, that's where the Fidik Rebbe was on the second floor where he died. It was a few minutes before Kol Nidre. And Rabbi Mentlik is summoned upstairs to the Fidik Rebbe. He goes up, you know, it's a, a very holiest moment of the year. The Friedrich Rebbe is sitting there in his chair, dressed in a kittel and a talus. And the way Rabbi, Men- Rabbi Hitler repeated the way Rabbi Mentlik said it, he says, the Rebbe, he knew Rabbi Mentlik spoke very slowly and deliberately, he says, the Rebbe is Gizetzen, the Amalach Hashem Svokes, like a, a, an angel of God. And he was standing there, Rabbi Mentlik, and didn't know what. The Friedrich Rebbe says to him, as Baich Nochim Kippur, so Sgain Su Harav Pardis, Borapak. 
Zogen, a der and der Bochet, from the name, is minor akin. And he repeated, Zogem a der Bochet is minor akin. Tell that Rabbi, Rabbi Pardis, that that Bochet, that now Rabbi mentally had no clue what happened. So that's what the Fridi could have told him. So right after Yom Kippur, I'm assuming he didn't do anything before that, didn't go eat. He went straight to Borough Park, strange time. He knocked on the door, they're eating the meal. So he's gone to the and Kippur. And he says to Rav uh, Pardis, he has a message from the Rebbe. Rav Pardis called him into the private chamber. And he told him that this Bochel, the Rebbe is akin, the Rebbe is a minor akin. And he repeated it twice as well, the minor akin. So Rav Pardis said, Tazam achut in Vilizich with such a machut, I don't want to uh, uh, argue. I don't want to. Uh... So the shidduch was reinstated. He got married. As a matter of fact, a grandson of his was in my class in Ocean Parkway years later. I didn't know the story at the time. Erevium Kippur, right before Kol Nidre, a Rebbe has a lot of things to do, you could imagine. Of all things, the Fidik Rebbe chose was to tell Rabbi Mentor this. So immediately brings us reminiscent to what happened a year later, two years later actually, that the Rebbe, Tavshin Yudbeis, said, It's a meaning to bless children before you keep it before Kal Nidre. For Baal, the kingdom, obviously the Rebbe didn't have the Egni kingdom, biological. And he was going to invent them. First time the Rebbe instituted the Birches Habonim, which became a sacred, maybe the most sacred moment for any Bokhir. The Rebbe blessing his own children in his room, in Yechidus, with all the tears and all that poured out of the Rebbe to his own children. I mean, to me, I don't know if there's this more powerful thing that when you have a student, and says, So one teacher once told me, yeah, that means that children have to honor us teachers like they honor their parents. I said, yeah, but I think the person doesn't say, put it that way exactly, maybe it's the other way around. It's true, they have to honor. But I think it's more that you have to love your students like you love your children. Now I know the, the cynic will say, what happens if I don't love my children that much? or don't love them properly. Now, obviously, that's not what the Pasuk is referring to. The last Fabring in Simcha State of Tavshin and Beis, which is also worthwhile reading, you know, the Rebbe was always said, the Rebbe Ta'al's Bavodent, so everything is there. For some reason, the Rebbe decided to speak about children. He said the children should say, L'chaim. And the Rebbe spoke, Al Tigu B'Meshichei, Elu Teneke Shal Beis Rabbo. Pasuk used El Tigu B'Meshichei. They are called Meshiach. And the din is that when you're building the Beis Amidosh, everyone has to stop what they're doing except children who are studying. Because they are Beis Amidosh. They are Meshiach. That's what the Rebbe spoke about. I always thought about it. Why of all things the Rebbe spoke about that in that language? I think above all, and I say it to myself as well, though I'm not a teacher in a school, I teach in other ways, the most important thing that you're really doing, as I said my, at the outset, at the outset, you have an ashama, chilek elakam mamish in your classroom, above everything else. If Tanya means anything, that's what the Rebbe says in Pedic Beis. It's not theoretical. That's what he says. So you have a chilek elakam mamish sitting in a in a seat in your in your uh, class, and how are you uh, treating? Them? Every one of us has to take that to heart. This is not an excuse for any student to behave inappropriately or to just tolerate anything, but it's a way of looking at a person. I'm not here to talk about sneers. There are other experts on this, but I do know one thing: that the word sneers comes from a pasuk called Hatzna Leches in Hashem which actually talks about Kahanim. 
Oh, it's not just a female thing. And it's not just about what you don't do, but it's what you do do. You walk with dignity before God. If I was to make a litmus test, if I was successful in teaching a class, it would not be if they went away inspired or if they learned something new, but did they walk away more dignified and feeling more as channels of the Abishta in this world, that they are a chilika, selim el And that comes down to literally what you say and how you project. I mean, this may be sad, but this is true. When I was in yeshiva, the thing that was most memorable to me was a talk Rabbi Uspal, Olav HaShalom, gave us. And he lived up to what he said. And among all things, you know what he spoke about? Not his kashus, and not shlichus. He spoke about that we should be clean. That a bocha has to be clean. And he said, he said, every day you have to wash your hands and take a shower. There should be no dirt. Brush your teeth. You know, all these little technical things. Now, he could say somebody in a Goyesha public school could also say it. So I remember I went over to Abu Rishbal and I asked him why. Why? You know, not that I was... I, it's very nice to be clean. I don't think anyone has any complaint about it. So I remember, he took my hand and he said to me, I remember it was like so pressured by him. He said, Mamlech is in the great Kodesh. He said, from Mamlech is in the great Kodesh. You're from a kingdom of priests and a, a holy nation. And I remember the, the Rebbe said many times with Mesech de Zvachim that when the Roman general who later became emperor saw a Jew walking, he got off his horse with his entourage and went over and said, your garfu is hanging too low. And he picked up the garfu because Bamlech is in the gay Kodesh. So it's not about the cleanliness, it's the attitude. And I remember till this day, we're talking now over 60 years ago, 60, 50 years ago. I don't know how much more I remember, to be honest. And my memory isn't bad. But this was it's etched in me because it was a, uh, a standard. And it wasn't Moses. He wasn't telling us we were a bunch of dirty, and we're dressed to, like, like, to, like uh, schlumps. So I say to all of us, using the Rebbe's words, that we have Mashiach before us, it's in our children. I know technically you could say before Bas Mitzvah, before Bar Mitzvah. But it's the idea, the innocence that the children carry. And I have no doubt that the Rebbe established Shibas Hashem, not just to uh, inspire children, but he saw that we live in a time where there'll be new challenges, many challenges today, which I didn't really spell out. I, I just implied some of them in my words, using my own uh, principle of, of a seitev. Many challenges. And they will be exposed to more and more with the internet, with technology. The only defense is offense. Mulchem is tenufa, the Rebbe said, not Mulchem is hagonah. If you have what to fight for, you have something passionately to live for, a mission that has the best preemptive and preventive medicine. Nothing else will work properly today. Yeah, you can keep the, the demons and the negatives at bay to a certain extent, to a certain age. But there's just too many forces out there. And that's what the Rebbe did. He created an offense. Ten Mimim, the Rebbe Rashab, in his prophecy, literally. How did he know in 1897 what would happen in the world in the second, 20th century? World War I, World War II, the biggest upheaval, the Holocaust. I mean, everything changed. Everything. And the Rebbe Rashab says in the Kuntus Yitzhakhayim, and then the famous Sikha Kola Yitzhul Muhammad's Vez David Tofri Samachalif, that there's coming. Generations, the Kharfu Ever Ibecha Hashem, Kharfu Ikpus Meshikha. Generations that will not know what God is. Ignorance. This was in 1897. He didn't live in that world. In many ways, Tem Khatrim couldn't even fulfill its mission in the beginning of the 20th century. It's the Fridikra, especially the Rebbe, that saw it as a training ground to train thousands and thousands of men and women, Shulchem and Shulchis today, and all of us to go on this offensive war. That's what the yeshivas were not teaching. They were teaching Yiddish Shemayim. That wasn't the issue. But we need a lot more than that. You need a passionate fire to create a revolution because only offense would work. The Rebbe Rashab knew that then and the Rebbe actualized it. So if you ask me what the mission of this school is, the mission of all our yeshivas and both boys and girls is to create, yes, warriors. 
spiritual warriors. Spiritual warriors that will be on the offense and as aggressive as there are physical doctors, spiritual doctors, soul doctors. That's what every student that comes out of the school needs to be. Will everyone live up to the highest standards? We all know everybody has their challenges, but we need to know what those standards are. The Rebbe never lowered the standards because everybody has their challenges. You have to shoot for the highest, and then everyone gets as close as they can. How to translate that? That's a job that I believe each of us has. I want to finally say that I hope that what I said was not taken in any way in the wrong spirit. I wasn't here to criticize you or anybody. I just said, let's speak bluntly, because there is there are nefoshets at stake here. Your children, our children, I don't just mean our students, also our children, facing many challenges. And the best defense is offense. You prevent it, you preempt it. You don't wait till there's a problem. The Ibishta should help us all. Month of El, Melech Basada. So we have all the keiches of the Melech with us. In Basada, even in our mundane material activities, no matter where we are, we can ask everything we want. As Al Tadeba says, and the Ibishta gives it to us, the Panim Secha case, the smile, the Simcha. We should have all the and above all, nachas from our students, from our children, grandchildren. We should march even before Tishrei. We'll have meetings in Ashleima with the Rebbe that gives you all the keiches you need to fulfill your sacred mission. We'll have meetings in Thank you.